Let me begin with a story of two towns on the outskirts of our nation's capital, Delhi, Faridabad and Gurgaon. 25 years ago, Faridabad was the town of the future. It had industry, big corporations moving in, an active municipality, direct connection to Delhi, and a state government determined to make it a showcase. At the same time, Gurgaon was wilderness, rocky soil, bad agriculture, even the goats didn't want to stay there. But 25 years later, Gurgaon became the engine of India's economic growth, like Bangalore. It had 32 million square feet of commercial space, which housed the world's largest corporations, 27 malls, seven golf courses, fabled apartment complexes. Faridabad, at the same time, was still groaning under the weight of red tape and an extortionist bureaucracy. Gurgaon's disadvantage turned out to be an advantage. Not having a government meant it had no municipality, no one, no red tape, no one to block development. The new India is in some ways Gurgaon writ large. It's a story of private success and public failure. And so when two Indians meet over a chup cup of chai, they, can, they cynically say, India grows at night when the government sleeps. Now to rise without the state as Gurgaon has done is a brave thing. But is it sustainable? Is it sensible? So the fact is that both the Faridabad model of corruption and red tape and Gurgaon's model of laissez-faire entrepreneurship are really not the right models for governance for India's future. And this is what led me to write this book, India Grows at Night. And really, what we need in India is an effective, liberal, secular state. I think let us understand what we are. And I find it useful to compare always with China to understand India. You know, India is a bottom-up success, success of the people. China is a top-down success, a success of an amazing technocratic leadership. And therefore, no wonder India's history is a history of kingdoms competing with each other, of political disunity, and China's history is a history of empires. And in China, the emperor gave the law and then interpreted the law. In India, the law preceded the king, the law meaning dharma. And the job of the king was to uphold dharma. And therefore, oppression in India did not come from the state. It came from society. You see, India is an accumulator. China is an assimilator. Both countries, histories, were written by migrations from, East, from Central Asia, from the steppes. In China, they became a melting pot into one Han dynasty, these migrants. In India, these migrations resulted in a different jati, and we have 2,200 jatis or subcastes in, in India. If we are lucky, we might have a strong leader who is also a reformer. Now, my hope is the Mohalla Sabha, the Gram Sabha, that work in your ward. And that is really the starting point. What Tocqueville, the great French thinker, who wrote the best book in democracy there is, 
It was called Democracy in America. In the 1830s, he told the Europeans that you will never become democracies because you don't have the habits of the heart. And those habits of the heart are learned in these Mohalla Sabhas, in the New England town meeting. And that's really the best thing for today, for us is that the fact that grassroots democracy now is building up. And you know, every nation has a key word that, not every nation, some nations. And this key word opens or unlocks the secret of a country. Now, for America, that key word is liberty. And a lot of good and bad things are done, including the Tea Party movement, in the name of liberty. France, the key word of France is égalité. And again, the French will do many lunatic things in the name of égalité. Now, what is the key word for India? The key word I believe is a pre-modern word called dharma. Dharma has many meanings, but one of the most, the main meaning is doing the right thing. And there's a notion of public dharma that I spoke about, that is the king is supposed to uphold, the rulers are supposed to uphold. And I think that one of the tragedies of our 65 years is that nobody translated the wonderful ideals of our constitution into the language of dharma. The last person who tried to do that was Mahatma Gandhi when he fought untouchability. He used the word sadharan dharma. And our constitution builders were very intent of dharma because they placed the wheel of dharma, the Ashok Chakra, in our flag to remind us that it was a moral project that we were undertaking. By the way, I also advocate something else in my book, which is a new liberal party, because I can't find myself being able to vote for any existing party. <laughs> and the new liberal party is a party which is fundamentally grounded in the moral notion of dharma, doing the right thing, but also the, of economic reform, of institutional reform. I think also the rise of India, not only good for the 1.2 billion Indians, but also good for the world. Because when Western economies are soul searching for the right solutions, a nation is rising in the East based on the classical principles of economic and political liberty. And it is showing uh, the world that this, that this is the way to the future. Thank you.